Hi, and welcome to the How to Play Darkest Dungeon video series, courtesy of GameWisdom.com. Hello, this is Josh Beiser from GameWisdom.com. Welcome to a very quick video series, hopefully. I've returned to the Darkest Dungeon. By the time you're watching this, Darkest Dungeon will be out on the PS4 and Vita. And I know my Darkest Dungeon How-To Guide was one of the most popular series on the YouTube channel. But it could use some work, especially in terms of making it a little bit easier to digest. So, with the game due out, I decided to basically go back through it. So. For this video series, if you've already watched the Darkest Dungeon plays, you're not going to find anything too new here. This is mainly going to be meant for new players, either those who have bought it recently, or who are buying this on the console or Vita. We're going to keep these videos to about 30 to 40 minutes, or one mission, and we're just going to go probably far enough to get to the first boss fight, which won't be, you know, a huge deal. If you're expecting to see the high-end style, I'm talking Champion and the Darkest Dungeon run itself, you're not going to find that in this video series. Anyway, I've already played through the tutorial, which I almost lost one character already. So, for this video we're going to look at the town itself and our characters, as well as going on the first mission. You always start with Raynal and Dismas here. Here are their stats. You can see resistances over here. Camping skills here. Each character will always have three of these seven randomly unlocked. These three are ba basically defaults for all characters, and these four are class exclusive. Every class has seven skills, ranging from melee, range, buffs, you name it. If you look on the skill, you can see the yellow dots above the word smite. Those are the positions that the Crusader must be in to use that skill. The red dots are the enemy positions he can hit with that. You can see skills like in stun. We have stats over here. The base stats are always the same per class. Two Crusaders will always have the same stats to Highwayman, etc. Quirks can change this. Positive quirks are over here. Negative ones are over here. Now, just from the get-go, the game likes to troll you. Kleptomaniac means that they will have a chance of stealing the loot you get from fights, and basically makes Reynold a character you're either going to have to get rid of that quirk or throw out as quickly as you can. But right now, beggars can't be choosers. Equipment down here is again locked to classes, but you'll be able to upgrade gear at the blacksmith. Over here we have his abilities. He starts, as you can see, he gets a plus two speed, which affects his base stats. He also has additional stun resist, which you can see here. And before we go on further, we'll just quickly go over these two classes. Crusader is your frontline warrior slash tank. He is meant to stay in the front rows here and either protect the crew, do some light healing, and essentially be your forward warrior. Very useful as well as being able to just take damage thanks to his high health and his ability to mark himself and raise protection. Protection is simply a resistance to damage. Higher it is, the more damage they'll resist. This will also apply to enemies, and it is possible to resist all the damage coming in if you get it high enough. Here's our settlement, and this is sort of the metagame. As we go on, this town will become more active, and we'll get more features out of it. In time, you will know the tragic extent of my failings. Yeah, yeah. What's new with the, the final, I guess, big update to the game was town events that can show up. All will find their way to us now that the road is clear. So we're gonna go to our stage coach. This is how you will always get people to join you. Then when you start, 
these two are always going to be available. If you come over here, each building or each service can be upgraded using heirlooms. This shows you the, the requirements and their numbers. It will go up each time. The first thing you should always do is get the stagecoach network up to at least four. This means that you will always, by guarantee, have four characters which you can take into a mission. So we'll need to worry about that next mission. Nothing else is made available just yet, so we can't really do much here. I did get some trinkets. Trinkets are essentially your ways of buffing characters. Common ones will usually have a debuff along with a positive. He's already slow enough, and you can see it's not really that big of a deal just yet. This has no negative, so I'm just going to put that one there, giving him a 70% chance to resist. We'll talk more about resist when the time comes. Let's get to our main town, Mecca of madness or our main infinity. estate. Your work begins. The estate is broken up into five areas, ruins, warrens, weld, and cove. And then the darkest dungeon is up here, being the most sinister. Each week that you play, you will get random quests in these areas and the ones you've unlocked. The difficulty will be dependent on what heroes you have available. If you have all level 4 heroes, you will get level 3 quests. If you have all level 1 and 2, you'll get those quests. Here we have our rewards, which are randomly generated, but you will always get better rewards for the harder quests. So let's get our crew going. This is just a way of letting you know that you got sort of a theme party. There's no benefit or negative for this. It's just a little bit of lore or uh, fluff. Our other two classes, we have the Vestal. This is your healing or frontline warrior class. She can be built either way, either for spell casting using skills in the back row like this, or being a frontline warrior who can also slightly heal as well using divine comfort. She is considered one of two primary healers in the darkest dungeon, the other one being the occultist. So most likely you're going to either have a Vestal or an Occultus in your party, unless you're going for very specific builds. The Plague Doctor, backup healer who can, who's mainly meant to cure Blight and Bleed, which are damage over time skills, but she is also the expert at stunning, as you can see with the Blinding Gas and Plague Grenade. I'm sorry, Blinding Gas and nope, just this but she's also the best at causing blight. Their blight skills are some of the most damaging in the game and damage over time skills can stack, which means they'll do more damage per turn. So when you're going up against characters who are weak against blight, Plague Doctor is really good to have. They can also do some okay melee and buffing. And they can also stun one person and, sh and shuffle the party around. And I don't think I mentioned the Highwayman. The Highwayman is a good jack-of-all-trades class. Again, can be built for frontline shooting and stabbing, or back row shooting and just staying back there. A really good combination is point-blank shot and duelist advance. Duel and you can see the damage mod 50% plus which means that it will do 50% more damage based on his base damage, while his other shots are usually negative 25, negative 60, stuff like that. But yeah, pretty good. Duel's Advance activates his Repose, which means if someone attacks him, he will attack back. But enough talk, let's get into this. The cost of preparedness measured now in gold later in blood okay this is where you take your provisions or items that you're going to use on that map you'll get a slight refund for any items you keep 
at the end, but generally it's better to go over than under. 12 should be good enough for the first dungeon. Torches, very important, we'll talk about that when we get in. Always good to bring at least two shovels. And the rest are meant for situational and buffing or debuffing situations. Oh wait, the key. I always take one key, you never know when you'll find a chest. So anti-venom is used to cure poisons and blights. And if there is something that needs to be cured or uh, disinfected in the dungeon, you can use anti-venom. You'll find the well will have a lot of this. Bandage, used to protect someone's hands when they're trying to grab something, and will cure bleeding. Medicinal herbs, cures debuffs, and also removes or gets rid of infections when you're trying to deal with stuff. The key, open doors or strong boxes, really it's just meant for strong boxes in the game. Holy water, can apply a resistance to your characters, and can uh, decurse unholy or evil looking things. And then the torch, again used for light. Again, this is one that you're going to probably want more than you probably much want to go over. But this is usually good. Your inventory will not grow. So this is all we're going to get. And as you get better into the game, you're going to find that you'll need less of these items and will try to hoard more of the rewards you get. But, let's get into it. Yep, nothing we can do here. Each time you go into a mission, the map layout will be procedurally generated. There are some rules which you can use to sort of help you in terms of where to go, but for the most part, you are going to be wandering around. Encounters are not random. They are, have been placed on the map. So, here we have our UI here. Characters have health and stress. If health hits zero, they will enter death's door state, which gives them a debuff for the rest of the dungeon, unless you cure it while camping, or by leaving. When they're at death's door, the next bit of actual damage they get will have a chance at killing them. And if a character dies, they are gone for good. Stress grows by just wandering around and taking special stress-based damage. When your stress hits 100, your character will have basically a breaking point moment. They will either rise to the occasion and get better, or they will suffer a malady, which will affect them for the remainder of the dungeon. We'll probably see one or two of those over the course of this quick Let's Play. You can also shift characters around. It will cost them a turn, and some characters can only move certain ways. You can see you can move back two or four too. Now our quest here is to explore 90% of the rooms. What that means essentially is that for short dungeons we can miss one room, medium dungeons we can miss two, and long dungeons we can miss three rooms. This is a way of sort of gauging yourself and hopefully being able to push to just what you need to complete. Our torch here, the higher the light, the more advantage we have as you can see. It will give us a chance of getting more information and surprising enemies, but if we make it darker, at the chance for critical hits for both sides grow, but we'll also get more rewards. For starting out, until we get some upgrades going, you're going to want to keep this light at least above 75. Now I have no idea what to expect here. There we go, another torch. So as you can see, we now get more stress, so I'm going to use my torch there. You can also use T to use a torch. And we have our first fight. We surprise them, so we get priority for turn one. You can look down there, you can see the enemy's stats, including their dodge, their speed, which determines how quickly they'll react, and their resistances. 
So skeletons, you will never bleed them. They have a 200% chance to resist. Blight, they only have a 10% chance. And to calculate your actual chance, you basically take your character's base versus their resist. So she has a 100% chance to blight. They have a 10% chance to resist. So the actual chance is really a 90% chance to hit, which I think is pretty good. So we will use this. As you can see, Noxious Blast only works on position 1 and 2. So now he will take 4 damage at the start of his turn. Which means if we do 2 more points of damage, he will die before he'll have a chance of doing anything. So I will use the Grape Shot Blast here and try to hit everyone. So this guy is now officially dead. He just doesn't know it yet. So I can now focus on you. Now her melee attack does more damage against unholy enemies, but she's not built for that. So instead, I'm going to try and go for the kill. Is broken. Enemies will leave a corpse behind that will basically keep the enemy's position in place until the corpse is either destroyed or you shuffle the body. As you can see he does more damage to Unholy. So this guy is dead. Another one falls. Here's our reward. So we have a little lock box here. It's already been unlocked so we can just open it. We get some heirlooms, and we get another shovel. This first one is kept, I think, usually around the same pattern, so... Not too many surprises, but you never know. Here's some Even rubble. If you run out of shovels, you'll have to dig with your hands, but it will cost you torchlight, stress, and health on your whole party. There's that. Alright. This is our first actual stress causer. The Acolytes will hit you for stress damage, causing this to go up and up. In longer dungeons, this can spell doom, and is normally why you want to take them out as quickly as possible. Because they have high dodge, it means that there's a good chance you're going to miss. Now their accuracy is pretty good, as you can see compared See, we'll see their accuracy when we get to the other ones. So I'm going to try and blight her and try and take her out as quickly as possible. You can see she has a 20% oh, 20 chance to resist. So we really have an E. And that's if it connects. Oh, and she resisted. Not good. So now I really want to take her out of the fight if possible. We only have a 67% chance though. So let's see. Good. She resisted, and that skill actually brings back some of the torchlight. Now, bleed is not going to work, but it is his main damage right now. Or we can try and do a little bit to everybody. We could buff. I'm going to try and do a little bit to everyone, see if we can thin out one of these two. Not bad, we hit all three. And because of his increased damage on Holy, he will most likely kill one of these guys. The Bone Soldier has protection, which means he'll resist 15% damage, so he's a good target to take out now. Back to the pit. Now it's their turn. She was stunned. Now once a character has been stunned... Oh. Will he stay? Good, he resisted. They will normally resist it for until they've gone again. Which means it basically prevents you from permanently stunning an enemy. I am going to go for this one. Confidence surges as the enemy crumbles. And we're gonna see if we can get another play grenade. Good. Because you can only heal by using food, camping, or heal skills during combat, I'm going to try and top him off before we move on to the next fight. And 
And I'm gonna show you what the Bulwark of Faith do. Or does, if we got more protection now. So he's been marked, so there's a greater chance she will target him. Which, of course, she doesn't do it when I say that. So they've been pushed back. One second, I just want to check one thing here. There we go. And now she is basically dead. Her next turn will come by and she will be... get the poison damage, but we'll try and speed things along. As the fiend falls, a fiend Not bad. Blossoms. Got some gold. Let's Seize move everyone back momentum. into position. Push on to the task's end. Okay. We're missing one room. We can pretty much ignore this room or this room. We got a scout, which lets us see immediately what's coming up. So, this mark is a room battle with some item we can interact with. This is a room with a treasure chest. These are curio, so special events. Purple is a trap, and this is nothing. So what we could do is go up, down, and hit that. That way we'll get everything. Or we can go up over here and just skip this room. It's usually good to play with the knowledge that you have. Now as you wander around, there's also... Uh-oh, his Kleptomania is coming in. So he's going to take that if stuff for himself. Could staunch the flow of that greedy so-and-so. But as I was saying, as we wander around, there is a chance for random fights to pop up here. Now, as you can see, it's now very dark, but we'll have a greater chance of crit, and we'll get more loot. So, you know what? We're going to roll the dice and see what happens. Now, we got very lucky there. Now, you see, our crit chance has gone up by 1%. So, we have another 3 here. Now, this guy is vulnerable to bleed. So I am think I'm going to see if we can start him off. Good. Same thing. We're going to try and blight her. Oh my god. Alright, let's try a stun. Oh. Not good. In this case, as with general RPG rules, it's good to try and take out an enemy per turn if you can. So, if we do at least 7 points of damage to this guy, he will die. Or we'll just kill him outright. Uh oh. Keep her there. Keep her there. Oh. Because she's out of position now, she won't be able to use the majority of her skills. But again, the Highwayman is good in multiple positions. Let's see, we can get a little bit of everybody. Come on. Later. Wow. The good news is that she's using her move skills. Even though it's making it a little bit harder to fight, she's not causing stress damage. Come on. Perfect. Give them no quarter. Now, of course, he can't do anything against the back row, at least not in this setup. So I'm just going to have him break this corpse and move her up. And the enemies are also um, constrained by their position. Some enemies cannot attack in the front row. Some of them can't attack in the back row. But you're dead. Got some... Good this stuff. expedition at least promises success. Move everyone back. So this is the chest we want to use the key on to get more rewards. And if you use the right item, it will also prevent any bad effects from happening if you use that item. Alright, so we're just going to let our stress get down. And if you hit zero light, you'll have the greatest opportunity for loot, but something bad may come for you. Oh, he's stealing all that. For a task well performed. Alright. Now, as you can see, we have a really good chance at causing crits. Well, 2% more. 
Alright, since we're doing really good, I'm going to roll the dice again and see what happens. Okay. This guy is a nasty one. When he's in position 3 and 4, he has a very powerful attack that if it crits, it can really, really hurt you. So you either want to move him up or stun. So please stun him. Oh, you. There it is, Quarrel. Oh, thank you. He didn't crit that. But yeah, this is the guy we need to kill now. That blades him, he's dead. Good. Wonder when we'll get our first crit. Oh, by one. Damn you. You can see they are hitting pretty hard now. Try and... Oh, kill two birds with one stone. And we're not going to be able to stun him. He resisted the damage because of his protection, but not the blight. Damage over time skills will always eat through protection, which means if a character has 50 protection, he will still take full damage from blight and bleed effects. But this is going to be the time that I want to heal. And actually, I'm going to try and stun him. So we can get one more free turn. Oh, never mind of healing, as I thought. Now that's really good. This is a trinket. Again, the trinkets will allow you to boost characters, and this one is exclusive to the occultists. And that is a really damn good trinket. Now here, we have a fountain. The holy fountain will do will always do, I think, good stuff, but we can give an even greater chance by using holy water here. But I'm just going to use it and see what we get. I think this will heal him. There we go. And reduce his stress. We're coming up on a trap here. There it is. Characters will have a different chance of disarming. He has our best, so we're going to let him disarm. And that will also reduce stress. Uh-oh. We're about to hit Terror's pure darkness. Unless you are very good at the game, you do not want to keep it at this level. Especially with a level 1 party, so... I'm going to go up... Eh, we'll go up to 50. One more room and we win. Oh, come on you. Stop stealing my good stuff. Now we can also heal by using food. But... There are random chances for hunger events while you are in the dungeon. The hunger event will require everyone to take one piece of food, sometimes more or less depending upon their quirks. If you don't have enough food, the entire party will suffer a massive stress hit and take damage. Which is why you always want to keep four food in your party. Oh, there's the hunger event right here. You can see what happens if you don't eat anything. Okay. Now this will be the last room for this quest. Remember, I only have to hit 90%. If you retreat, you'll take whatever items you have here, but everyone will take a stress hit and the mission will be a failure. Let's see what happens. Oh, we got lucky. No fight here. So we have a choice. We can either hit that last room or just get the hell out. I'm going to explore the hallway, see if there are any curios. This is why I always bring at least two shovels. And you know what? Since this will be the end of this video, let's go all in, shall we? Another chest? Ooh. Very nasty combination. He will do stress damage. So the first thing that I want to do I want to try and stun these two. Good. Now he has protection, so we're not going to be able to do too much to him. I think it's time to use a tracking shot. 
This will give him a buff for three rounds, and you can stack buffs at least two more times, so a total of three. This guy is definitely going to be our big threat here. We can take him out, life becomes a lot easier. Uh, oh, you. And while these two are bad, I'm not as concerned about them. Come on, we need a good hit. Nice. With impunity. Here comes the stress. Oof. He now has his buff going, so I'm gonna try and shoot him down. Boom! First crit for us. That's really good for this play. With him out of the picture, we can now focus on this guy. But... Remember, he's gonna resist 25% of all damage coming in. But not Blight. So he will take full damage. Oof. Yeah, that crit, that could've put her at death's door. I wanna try and stun him. Mm. Oh, no crit against us, thankfully. I will use Judgment here. Oh. Come on, you. He has one more turn. But what I can do... As you can see, that boosted it up and reset the counter. He is now vulnerable to stun again, so let's see if we can get him the second time. Good. He's going to take four damage. Great. So, if he hits him once here, we win against him. Or he'll just kill him outright. Thank you. It's great when they listen to me like that. And he is now dead for sure once the blade kicks in. Great is the weapon that cuts on its own. Good. Now we don't have a key because Raynal here stole mine. So we're just gonna have to let one of these characters roll the dice and see what happens. Okay, nothing bad. We could have gotten more if we used a key though. But we're done here. After every mission, the game will reward you all your stuff. Just go through that. You'll also get experience. And then sometimes you'll get a chance of getting new quirks. So he will now resist bleed, which is a good one. She will now have a negative three chance to crit on all range skills. If we're building her for range, this is a terrible negative quirk to get. If we were using her for melee, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. So unfortunately, that would be one we would need to get rid of. The degeneracy of the Hamlet and if you wait too I long to remove a negative quirk, it will so become locked. Acres. So this one is now locked, which means that it will not go away and it will cost more to remove it. And we're sort of in a position, since so I'm going to use her for spellcasting, this is actually good for me. Because I'm not going to use her for melee. So this is basically one possible nev quirk that we don't need to worry about in this list. This one we would have to get rid of. So, before we wrap up this first play, new buildings are unlocked, and every week you'll get new heroes. And even though the base stats don't change, what skills they have available and what their quirks are, are randomly set. So this guy, plus 20% stress healed, negative 4 speed on the first round, will not pray or flagellate for stress relief. Not that good of a character to take, but we're in the beginning, so again, beggars really can't be choosers. The Jester is one of the more interesting characters. He is... The buffer, he, thanks to his battle ballad, he's also one of the few characters who can remove stress using Inspiring Tune. He also has some decent bleed skills. And he has one of the strongest attacks in the game with Finale, as you can see. 
basically the idea is you use solo and then finale as a combination. He's a very tricky character to use, but if you get him right, he can be a very useful one for the party. He also has plus 5 accuracy, and that's a really good quirk. Any quirks that positively affect the base stats are always great to have, including those that give you more protection, more accuracy, and even just more damage or health. So he would definitely be a good guy to get. This one, not as much. The Obsess and the Cravings means they will use those Cheerios by... They won't uh, wait for you to do anything. But the Vil here, I'm going to take him. He will be laughing still at the end. Now, the tavern is unlocked, so we can send characters here to reduce stress once a week. To the weary and broken alike. You can only put characters based on the number of slots you have. And you can upgrade the tavern to improve its effectiveness, lower the cost, or get more slots. And this becomes unlocked as you fill this in more. Not yet there. Same thing for the Abbey. The cobwebs have been dusted. The pews set straight. And there's a chance that random things can happen too when they do either the Abbey or the Tavern. Now, a new feature we have is the ability to trade curios. So if I want another paper here, another deed, I will trade three for one. So I'm going to do this. Or you see you can add more here. So six will get me two. Right now I just need the one, so I'm going to do this. And now what I can do is come over here. Get that to four. More arrive. This is pretty much what you want for a good portion of the game. Domain. When you get later in, you want to get more characters. But we'll eventually have to upgrade our space here. Experienced recruits give you a chance at getting higher level characters. This will save you time grinding, but there is a chance I'll have more quirks to deal with. Now we have some new stuff here. So I would want to give him the dodge stone. They already have a higher sense of dodge. This will just make it even better, as you can see. And they already have high speeds to begin with. Now the sanitarium has not been unlocked yet, so we can't do anything there. But that's going to do it for this first play. Like I said, we're going to keep this to about 40 minutes to an hour per play. If you have any questions about the Darkest Dungeon, please let me know in the comments below. Like I said, we're going to do this up until probably the first boss. If there is enough push to keep going. I will need a lot of people to tell me otherwise. We may go further, but that will be our stopping point for right now. So, thanks for watching this first play of How to Play the Darkest Dungeon. I'm Josh Blazer from GameWisdom.com, and I'll see you next time with part two. Take care. Thanks for watching the video, everybody. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment, of course, share your friends. It always helps out. Check out game-wisdom.com where I examine the art and science of games. You can follow me on Twitch and Twitter under GWBicer for the latest updates of new content. And be sure to check out our Patreon campaign. You can find us on Patreon under Game Wisdom. If you would like to donate and help contribute to keeping Game Wisdom going. Your donations can not only give us the monthly funding we need to keep supporting ourselves, but if we can hit some goals, it will mean more great content for you. And there are some nifty little rewards there as well. Thanks again for watching this video, and be sure to tune into the next one real soon.